Here at ACC 16, in Chicago of course, investigators are presenting two separate sub-analyses of Pegasus Timmy 54, which investigated the long-term use of Tecagrelor in patients with a history of myocardial infarction and at least one additional risk factor for thrombotic cardiovascular events. The first sub-analysis included patients with peripheral artery disease and the second patients with diabetes. So to do this, I'm talking with Dr. Mark Bonaca, who is an MD, and he's with, of course, the, uh, the Timmy study group, and from Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, where you're lead investigator for this, the PAD sub-analysis of Pegasus, and you're part of the Vascular Medical Center there in Brigham. This is really an important group of people, some really high-risk folks, but let's talk first about why did you focus on this population of patients with PAD? Yeah, so we know that patients with peripheral artery disease are at a heightened risk of ischemic uh, risk, so uh, myocardial infarction, stroke, cardiovascular death. And we know that patients with prior MI and PAD, so-called polyvascular disease, are at even higher risk. So this is a very high-risk population. As you noticed in uh, the introduction, uh, Pegasus TIMI-54 overall showed that Ticagrelor reduced cardiovascular risk over the long term. There was some increase in bleeding. And so we felt this was a cohort that might derive particularly robust benefit from more intensive antithrombotic strategy uh, as long-term secondary prevention. So how many patients were analyzed? So uh, just over 1,000 patients were in the PAD subgroup. Uh, and they were analyzed uh, as the primary uh, group for this, this study. And it's like over a three-year period, right? Yeah, so all the patients were randomized one to three years prior, after MI. Uh, this 1,100 patients or so had symptomatic uh, peripheral artery disease or abnormal ABI, and they were followed for three years of therapy. And so what did you find? So first we found that when you look at patients that have peripheral artery disease and prior MI versus patients with prior MI alone, those that have PAD are at much higher risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. The event rate at three years was 20%, meaning one in five patients had CV death, MI, or stroke, uh, versus a much lower rate in patients without peripheral artery disease. And when you look at the individual events, they're at higher risk of cardiovascular death, all-cause mortality, and of course, limb events. So first we saw that it was a much higher risk population than those without PAD, and that that relationship remained even after we adjusted for all of the imbalances at baseline so that they have more diabetes, more smoking, even after you adjust for that, they're at higher risk. Is that appreciated among the cardiovascular community? Yeah, I, I think that um, people understand that patients with peripheral artery disease are at higher risk for ischemic events, uh, n not necessarily beyond prior myocardial infarction. And so I think this does add to that in that polyvascular disease, as others have described, uh, is uh, a much higher risk population. And then the second part of the analysis, of course, was looking at uh, how they responded to therapy. For the second analysis, you did a sub-analysis of almost 6,800 patients with a prior MI and diabetes. Yes. So what went on in that study? Yeah, so similar to peripheral artery disease, diabetes uh, indicated a higher risk population within the trial cohort. And so uh, di diabetes, much like PAD, uh, more aggressive atherosclerotic phenotype, uh, worse outcomes. And then both of these populations, by nature of their higher risk, uh, both translated into a greater absolute risk reduction with Ticagrelor. Uh, for the PAD population, the absolute risk reduction was more than 4% over three years for a number needed to treat of about 25. And so uh, very attractive. And, and in the 60 milligram dose, that, was, uh, that is approved for use actually had a very attractive efficacy profile with reductions uh, in CV death and all-cause mortality. And so I think these really underscore that higher risk populations derive greater benefit. We saw the same thing in PAD, a greater absolute risk, uh, I'm sorry, in diabetes, greater absolute risk reduction. And similar to non-diabetic patients, there was an increase in Timmy major bleeding with Ticagrelor. Yes. But it did not offset the uh, advantages. Yeah, and so you raise a very important point. I think one of the themes at this conference has been the struggle that we're uh, all grappling with in terms of applying the DAPT and the Pegasus TIMI-54 data in clinical practice. Exactly. It's a very broad population, coronary disease getting stents or prior myocardial infarction, and people have said, well, in order to uh, take on this bleeding risk, there needs to be a robust risk reduction, it needs to be offset. and so. Part of these subgroup analyses is to illustrate to the clinical community that there are subgroups of patients that are at very high risk that, that derive a great uh, absolute risk reduction. And I think we've seen that now with the PAD population and the diabetes population. And I think importantly, 
the most sophisticated way to sort of integrate all these factors is through risk scores. And so um, Bobby Yeh uh, and the DAP team have put out a risk score for post-PCI patients, and Aaron Bahula and Dave Morrow have put one out for uh, long-term secondary prevention. I think uh, these type of subgroup analyses help inform uh, the need for those type of risk scores, which sort of add all these factors together and say, this patient's gonna get a robust benefit that's worth the risk. I mean, the, right before the ACC 16 meeting, uh, the ACC put out an updated guidelines. Yes. Uh, it's focusing on DAP to use. Yes. And have you had a chance to look at those yet? Does it Does it help? Well, I think it, it really, I think, stresses the need for individual, individualization of care. There is no one size fits all, and I think that comes out loud and clear in the guidelines and is appropriate. They do talk about things like the DAP risk score, and, and there are other uh, risk scores that, that have been published, the, the one by Aaron Bahula that I mentioned. And I, I think to me that's what the takeaway is, that we can't, um, we can't make this an algorithmic decision. We have to really select patients based on their risk, uh, their tolerability, or their ability to tolerate drug and their bleeding profile. And hopefully these sub-analyses, this PAD subgroup where you know, one in five have a bad event at three years and you can have uh, greater than 4% absolute risk reduction, I think that, that may be meaningful to clinicians as a subgroup that derives particular benefit. Well, I advise that you go check out online at acc.org because they do have a whole section that's kind of focused on this update of the guidelines thanks to the DAP study and some other analyses like this one that has come along recently. So for CardioSource World News, I'm Executive Editor Rick McGuire.